in diabetes, you lose an average of two decades of life. You wish to try to be the promoter of your own healthy lifespan, and there are ways that you can do it with little steps. There is not a single bullet or a magic uh, solution. Dr. Ricordi, it's a pleasure to have you. It's great to be here, thank you. Well, people with diabetes have been hoping against hope for a miracle to happen. And you once said that insulin has been a life savior since they were introduced more than 100 years ago. What do you believe to be the next game changer? I think uh, insulin has been a lifesaver because people and children were dying, were going through starvation diet and was uh, incompatible with life in the short term. But what emerges is that insulin itself uh, is uh, still linked to a lot of chronic complication of diabetes, which remains an accelerated aging disease. Now there are artificial pancreas, insulin pump, continuous glucose monitoring system. So the day-by-day -day life of people with diabetes has been improving steadily and continuously, but uh, we still hope that the biologic cure will be the final solution. We know that you spent your entire professional career on the research and treatment of diabetes uh, with a renewed focus, with a determined focus, I should say, on finding a cure to the disease. Um, how far are we, or if you like, how close are we in more positive terms? Well, I think there is a lot of hope now because the last uh, challenge, the last quantum leap we need to develop uh, uh, to call it a cure is to be able to replace the missing function of the pancreas of producing insulin that is lost with diabetes. So it's, um, now there are two trials on the pipeline. One is just started with a device that you implant uh, under the skin semi-permeable membrane to protect the cells from the immune system attack without having to use anti-rejection drugs. And the second technology is uh, from a tolerance, is a microgel that you combine with the islets at the transplant site to induce tolerance at the site where you transplant the insulin producing cells to avoid the need for anti-rejection drugs. So that could very well be uh, the last step. Then of course the last challenge will be to have a unlimited source of insulin producing cells, but in that direction we have a lot of uh, new development from stem cell derived islets, so that uh, from embryonic stem cell or inducible pluripotent stem cells that you can develop in, in bioreactor and produce islets that could potentially treat an unlimited number of uh, patients with diabetes. Which part of your current research do you believe holds the most promise in finding that ultimate goal of reaching a cure. Now we're moving towards creating this uh, engineer mini organ in the abdominal cavity to go outside the liver where is a, is a non-retrievable site if you inject hundreds of thousands of this microscopic structure to the liver. It's much more desirable to have it in a confined space, especially moving to stem cell derived islets. If something uh, goes wrong or you want to retrieve the transplant, you need to have it more accessible. And diabetes is indeed a global health issue and um, the original thinking was that uh, it's mostly prevalent in affluent Western countries. But a study published on The Lancet last year said that there's been a substantial increase in the diabetes population in China from 98.4 million to almost 141 million during the past decade. And its prevalence in Chinese adults was projected to increase from 8.2 percent to almost 10 percent in the next decade, up till 2030. That's pretty alarming, isn't it? What are some of the contributing factors uh, to this explosive rise? Yeah, it's a, it's a global uh, epidemic, it's not just uh, China. For the diabetes epidemic that now is over 500 million worldwide, is projected to be over 750 million in the next two decades. You have uh, to distinguish type 2 diabetes from type 1 diabetes. They are both increasing, but type 1 diabetes is 5% uh, or less of the global problem of diabetes. But the type 2 diabetes, that is the majority of diabetes, is more associated with lifestyle and nutrition. And is, uh, has been shown that you can prevent more than 50% of diabetes with proper healthy nutrition and moderate physical exercise. And before we go deeper into the lifestyle factors, I want to talk more about this 
genetic factor. People tend to think that diabetes runs in the family, and indeed there is a considerable a genetic component to it. For example, the heritability of type 2 diabetes ranges from 30 to 70 percent. Uh, help us understand the impact of the genetic factor in the disease. If you have your parents or relative with diabetes, you may have 20 to 30 percent more chance to develop diabetes, mm -hmm. but you also have an, an opportunity to try to intercept the progression because you know you are at risk and in type 1 diabetes like 95 percent of people have no family history of the new cases diagnosed is a mix of genetic predisposition factors but also how you can affect them with your lifestyle choices what are some of the things that people could do to reduce the lifestyle factors uh, risk factors you have to look a lot uh, about nutrition and uh, keeping your weight under control and also insulin resistance that start uh, developing and in becoming a problem years before it may become diabetes. Unfortunately, a lot of people walk around with uh, insulin resistance without knowing it and a lot of them also have a uh, silent inflammation in the blood. But uh, these are two problems and two risk factors that are easily detectable if you can check with them at the blood control. And if you identify inflammation or insulin resistance, you can treat it and you can prevent them from becoming a problem. We have supplements right now. Our protocol that can decrease the requirement for insulin production and improve metabolic control and also is studied to prevent the progression of um, diabetes. And there is an article that just came out Last week, the, the best study has been vitamin D and omega-3 to try to intercept progression. And people used to think in terms of lifespan, that is how long you're going to live. And then that's becoming an increasingly outdated concept. Right now, the new thinking is how well you're going to live and how long you're going to live well. Should people pin their hopes more on perhaps medical and clinical breakthroughs or should they you know, pin their hopes more on their personal behaviors. I want to make a difference between longevity and lifespan and health span, that is healthy lifespan. You cannot just focus on treating diseases when they become a global problem, but try to prevent them and keeping people, preventing people from becoming patients. It's interesting that one of the cheapest thing that you can do is walking or physical exercise. So the message is that we don't have to wait for the government to change everything or your workplace. That We have to conquer the blue zone within each of us, if you wish, to try to be the promoter of your own healthy lifespan. And there are ways that you can do it with little steps that you can start taking every day to arrive to this ecosystem, because there is not a single bullet or a magic uh, solution. So that's why we talk uh, about an ecosystem of uh, healthy lifespan and not just a single magic uh, remedy. It's critically important for society and, uh, and globally to try to work and invest in prevention, predictive diagnostic and uh, intercepting disease progression before it becomes apparent and becomes such a huge cost. But, uh, there was a very important paper that came out in Nature Aging showing that if you increase healthy longevity, healthy lifespan, for every year you add to health span, you save 38 trillion or 38,000 billion dollars to the global economy. So it's actually a huge saving and you could reinvest this uh, massive amount of resources in other challenges that face our century. Uh, that is a, a very strong message to the international community that uh, healthy lifespan must become a priority.